Welcome to South to North, coming to you from our studio on the Wits University campus in Johannesburg, South Africa. In March 2013, Bushra, a 19-year-old Syrian mother of two, walked into a refugee camp in Tripoli, Lebanon. She symbolically became the one millionth refugee to flee Syria's devastating civil war. Over half the refugees are children, most under 11 years of age. Both sides of the Syrian conflict now stand accused of international human rights violations. The UN warns of an unfolding humanitarian disaster, but behind the Syrian headlines of one million refugees lies the plight of more than half a million Palestinian refugees that have made Syria their home. The majority of them live in the Damascus area, the site of recent intense fighting forcing them to flee. Once again, six decades into a seemingly unsolvable conflict, they are stateless. How do international organizations protect people like the Palestinians in these war zones? What is to be done? Our guests today are Filippo Grandi, the Commissioner General of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, who's tasked with the welfare of the Palestinian refugees. He joins us from Jerusalem. And from South Africa, Dr. Alex Borain, former president of the International Center for Transitional Justice. Later, Susan Abulhawa, the Palestinian-American activist and author of the best-selling novel, Mornings in Janine, will join us. For now, I want to welcome Dr. Alex Borain and from Jerusalem, Filippo Grandi. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Filippo, let's start with you. For the past 25 years, you've seen the catastrophe of human displacement all over the world, Syria, Sudan, Afghanistan, Iraq. What have been the most compelling and disheartening aspects of your work? You know, refugees are always the result of a political failure. So the most disheartening aspect of my work and the work of my colleagues is when a political solution to the conflicts that generate refugees doesn't come about and uh, the plight of exile continues. And the most encouraging aspects of our work, well, there are many. One is to give opportunities to people even when they're in exile. At one extreme, of course, immediate relief, but also in the longer term, developmental opportunities. But the best satisfaction is, of course, when a political solution occurs, when conflicts end, and refugees can return home or find a solution, a stable solution, and an end to their exile. Stay with us uh, as we bring in our next guest and hear more about the plight of refugees all over the world. There are, of course, historical links between the Palestinians and South Africa. President Mandela of South Africa famously said in 1997 that South Africa's freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. Archbishop Desmond Tutu has said that what Israel is imposing on the Palestinians is as bad if not worse than the old apartheid regime here in South Africa. And others, of course, have even called for sanctions against Israel. I want to welcome Dr. Alex Borain, who was one of the architects of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Welcome to South to North. Thank you. Now, the United Nations has found that Israel is engaged in systematic and institutionalized racism against the Palestinians. Can we draw parallels with the South African experience? Well, I think we can. There are those who argue that, uh, that situations are, are too different and should be described differently. But uh, having visited the area and having lived in South Africa all my life, virtually under apartheid, uh, it seems to me that there is a, a very clear link of oppressor and people who are seeking deliverance, who's, who are resisting, but resisting against unbelievable odds. So if you erect walls which prevent people from moving from place to place, which affects their livelihood, uh, their water supply, uh, their schools, uh, their access to hospitals, uh, that's apartheid. For Israel to protest against this comparison, I think, is playing word games. Would calling Israel an apartheid state, acknowledging that, help find the political solution uh, and resolution that Filippo was talking about earlier? I think that if Israel was to face up to this, that their occupation 
uh, of the West Bank, their uh, blockade of Gaza, their whole attitude, it's, it's not only uh, legalistic, it's not only structural, but to see the interplay of actions between Israelis and Palestinians pushing down the one and pushing up the other. We know what that was like in this country, and it's there. And until they face up to that truth, we're not going to be able to find a solution. Uh, Filippo Grandi, how do you feel about that? I know that your task as, as the United Nations right now is to provide relief for refugees, but you're the one who spoke about a political solution, a political resolution. Should the world wake up to the fact that Israel is an apartheid state or we're not there yet? What are your thoughts? To believe that um, diminishing the importance of uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict sidelining it, as it were, um, does, not, uh, does not chase that conflict away. That conflict is still open, is a festering wound uh, uh, in the, in the, uh, at the center in, of a strategic area for the whole world. And until that, that conflict is addressed in all its components, and one of its components is the question of Palestine refugees, then we will not have peace here in this region and further afield. I use the example of Bushra. We know the story of her fleeing with her children, her husband still missing and living with the fear of rape. And as a woman, I can identify with that. Is that the typical experience of everyday life for a refugee? Unfortunately, it is. It is a rather extreme experience, but it is more common than people think. Exile is not just being away from one's everything, and that is hard enough for any person. Uh, refugees are a very, very vulnerable lot in today's world, and those from Syria that we're dealing with right now are no exception. Now, it seems to me that the Palestinian refugees have walked from one catastrophe to another, fleeing the conflict between Palestine and Israel and walking into a civil war uh, in Syria. Does that make it particularly difficult for the UN to come in and alleviate their plight? They happen to have left their homes in 1948, 1949, and to be exiled in a region that uh, has always been uh, affected by successive conflicts. So even as their plight was not being resolved, they found themselves in other people's wars. It's the case of Lebanon in the 70s and 80s and in, in other places as well. And today, those Palestinian refugees that uh, find themselves in Syria, they're still in Syria after more than 60 years without a solution to their original uh, uh, cause for flight. Now, as bad as the situation is, as the United Nations, are you still able to deliver your services? Are your facilities open? Do hospitals and schools function? We have a very good network on the ground. We've been there, UNRWA has been there for more than 60 years, so we've developed a very good network and we're still able to reach uh, our refugees, but it is increasingly dangerous. And this is not a clear-cut war where there is a neat uh, front line on one side the government, on the other side the opposition. This is a messy war. The most frustrating uh, part of their experience is the absence of a solution to their very long plight. And uh, the, absence, the absence of redress for the injustice that in 1948 and 1949 caused their plight. Recently, the status of Palestine has changed, has improved, upgraded in the United Nations. Is that a positive step, a step in the right direction towards achieving peace? Does that help this cause and protracted war? I think it certainly does. Otherwise, they would never have gone and applied for that. But the tragedy is that it was voted against by the United States of America. And this happens time and time again. And in my view, they. The, the, the tremendous work that is being done to care for refugees uh, is, is good, and, and, and one would never criticize that. It's a, a thankless, difficult task. But it's ambulance work. What we need is to stop the, the accidents, to stop the crisis.
Let's hear from uh, Filippo. Filippo Grandi, tell us your response to the change in status of the Palestinians. Does that help to alleviate uh, the pressure in this conflict somehow? Refugees continue to be refugees wherever they are, no matter if they're Palestinians or others, until there is a specific solution to their question. So I would agree with Mr. Borain that, uh, that of course, uh, uh, that is what is needed. It is that just right solution according to United Nations resolution that have spoken uh, about this uh, a long time ago. I would only slightly disagree, but it is a very slight disagreement with the definition of ambulance work. I think that we do ambulance work, but it is still possible in protracted refugee si situation also to give a little bit more than emergency care to refugees. We do provide refugees with education, with health. We prepare them in a way for a better future, but we need the fundamental role of political actors to be played out for that future to come about. He's speaking about justice. Here in South Africa, we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission wow. where perpetrators and victims came together. I use the example of Syria where there have been human rights violations on both sides. Even in South Africa, it wasn't just the apartheid state. The anti-apartheid activists, there were human rights violations. You mentioned the ICC. What should happen with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? Who should come before the ICC? Given that in protracted conflicts like this, there are violations, widespread violations on all sides. I think we have to think outside the box. If we want to stop the killing in Syria, you're not going to do it by merely insisting on prosecution. One method would be to suggest to Russia, for example, which has been very supportive of Syria, Syria. and blocked the United Nations time and time again, that they should give the president of Syria a safe passage outside of that country so that the, the, the representative groups can come together and stop the killing. That's the first thing. Uh, and, and then work towards a just peace and decide whether it's possible. You know, justice is really the art of the possible, just as politics is. And it's not possible to do that now. That tyrant is sitting there and children and women and men are dying. Take him out of it. I know people will say this is impunity and this is robbing people of justice. It's a cop out somehow. We want peace at the expense of justice. Can we have peace without justice? Do we want to go on people dying or do we want to stop the killing and sort out the justice situation later on? It's justice, it's not perfect, but it is no, something. No, it's perfect justice. It's time to bring in our third guest, of course, while we talk of peace. Let me ask Susan Abulawa, the Palestinian activist and author of Mornings in Janine, to join us. Welcome, Susan. Welcome to the Thank you. Thank you very much. You were born of uh, refugees of the, 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 the Six Day War in 1967, displaced, lost your land, uh, raised in, 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 in an orphanage. This must be a very painful subject for you, that of refugees, given your own, your own personal experience. Absolutely, and the um, fact is there, there is a solution, there always has been a solution. Um, refugees have a right to return to their homes. The reason it seems to elude everyone is that the world um, insists on trying to accommodate Israel's desire to be a racist state, um, one, in, one that accords um, privilege and entitlement to Jews, um, uh, privilege, liberties, um, entitlements to, to various uh, rights, to land, to property, to liberties, better job opportunities, better education, etc. cetera. Um, and these privileges come uh, at the detriment of the indigenous population, which, is, which are Palestinians. Are, are, you, are you suggesting that the world must isolate Israel? Because I can understand from Philippa's side, when he says you need a political solution, there can be no lasting settlement or peace without the cooperation of everybody, Israel included. There seems to be no will in the international community, at least at the leadership level. Uh, I mean, really, this is the only instance in history that I'm aware of where the world has demanded that um, and oppressed people sit down with their oppressors and negotiate for freedom, as if freedom were negotiable, and to negotiate with for, for basic human rights um, as if they were political bargaining chips, and they're not. Philippa, let's bring you in here. 
Has the United Nations run out of ideas on how to end this conflict in the Middle East? I think what has always eluded uh, us has been the political will of, of coming to an end to the conflict, which means uh, difficult compromises. So uh, I would agree with uh, what Mrs. Abulhawa said, that uh, the parties to the conflict needs uh, 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 the pressure of the international community. That pressure has to be uh, impartial, has to be uh, uh, dec decisive, and, and, and has to look at all the unresolved issues. Susan, what, what practical solutions should, do you think should be applied there? Because if we're saying the two parties must come together, that cannot happen without the pressure from world nations. Who should start? What should spark off that pressure? And how, sh how should it manifest itself? Um, well, first of all, I'm not saying that the two parties have to negotiate this settlement. Um, I, I disagree completely because I, I don't think um, that an oppressed people can really negotiate for, for freedom with their oppressors. Um, you know, I, I think N Nelson Mandela said it best, uh, only free men can negotiate. So I think there needs to be a leveling of, of the playing field to begin oh. with. Um, well, you know, lacking political, um, international political will to sort of, to, to pressure Israel to comply with international norms um, and, uh, and end its uh, ability, to, ability to, to commit war crimes with impunity. Um, the, in, the Palestinian civil society has issued a, uh, a boycott call um, to, uh, to the international community, to civil society all over the world. What do you want the world to know about this conflict? I referred to your book earlier, Mornings in Janine. Now, it's a work of fiction, historic fiction, but it also depicts a 20th century protracted war. So firstly, is it biographical? And if so, what is it that you want readers and viewers to learn from this conflict? Um, well, it's, uh, it's not autobiographical. There are some elements that are. Um, but it, uh, it certainly depicts the Palestinian experience on... Uh, on a human level, unlike uh, unlike historic texts and and um, uh, legal reports and so forth, I think you know as Edward Said uh, once said, the world has had, has a difficult time comprehending this because we are in fact victims of the victims. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that we are indigenous to that land and we have every right to, to inhabit that land. But, but now yeah. that we have Filippo, we have Filippo Grandi with us, what do you want to say to him about this conflict? What would you like to see the world doing about it? The, the UN really is in a position to affect, uh, to, to put pressure on Israel. Um, even actually, you know, the, um, the Israeli lobby in the US, I understand, is actually trying to um, cut funding for UNRWA to, uh, to, to make Palestinian refugee lives even more miserable um, to try and, uh, you know, uh, as another means to get rid of us um, altogether. You know, I, I would like to see, although I'm, I'm saying this, but I have absolutely no faith that this is going to happen, but I would like the UN to uh, stand on its own principles um, and uh, enforce various resolutions as they seem to do all over the rest of the world um, to accord Palestinians uh, the, the basic human rights that are accorded to the rest of humanity. Filippo, your response to that before we let you go, please. Of course, the, the, uh, Susan said earlier that it is not good that uh, Palestinian refugees so many years after their flight are still languishing in camps. I would agree with that. That's why a solution is urgent. I repeat it again. I would like to add, however, that it is precisely the job of my organization, and everybody has a role in this crisis. Our role is to provide these people with education, health, and other uh, forms of relief uh, while a solution is expected. Filippo, thank you very much for giving us your time here on South to North. Filippo Grandi, thank you indeed. Thank you. Before we wrap up the show, I'm interested to get your thoughts on the, the, the conflict or what I identify as conflict between justice and peace. We had a solution here in South Africa where we chose a political solution, but the, the, the effects of apartheid continue to be seen. There are still people who want some recourse, who want justice. What should come first, peace, political resolutions or justice?
In essence, we are a people who have been evicted and are continually being evicted and oppressed for the simple reason that we are not Jewish. This needs to be first acknowledged um, and uh, and there has to be, I believe, some uh, restorative justice for, um, for Palestinian refugees. There has to be an infrastructure, a legal infrastructure, that provides for equality of citizens regardless of their religion. Currently, that is not the case. At the beginning of this road is acknowledgement. It is apology. It is leveling of the playing field. And then we can talk about um, how do we learn to live together. She's got a point about acknowledgement and apology. I mean, we first had to acknowledge as different people in South Africa that apartheid is, was wrong. Yeah. The genocide in Rwanda had to have all sides acknowledging that this was a human catastrophe, it was a, a, atrocious, and it should never happen again. And only then could they start conversations about peace. So, Alex, what's the way I, forward? I agree entirely. Um, there has to be acknowledgement. And that's why I said earlier, there's denial, and one has to deal with that. And one of the ways to deal with it is to acknowledge the situation. But I differ slightly in that there has to be some mechanism where eventually the two sides have to sit at the table. But if they both see themselves as victim, and, and I think that's the difference between what's happening with Israel and Palestine and South Africa, uh, where there were clear victims uh, who were marginalized and those who were perpetrators. Israel thinks it's, it's a victim in, in all of this. Yes, it is. So that's part of the, of the problem. And we had that in, in this country uh, after the war between Britain and the, and the Afrikaner. Afrikaner said, never again will we be dominated by anybody. We're going to make sure that we dominate and protect that. And the West just accepts that because we all feel guilty about the Holocaust. So if we do become critical, then we, we, we're accused of being anti-Semitic. We've got to forget about that. Uh, we all acknowledge the terror, terror of the Holocaust, but we've got to go beyond that. And there ought to be a definite acknowledgement by Israel of what they have perpetrated uh, since 1948. But that doesn't, it, it doesn't end there. That is kind of, a, if you like, an opening of a door to a room where the two sides on, a, on, a, on a, an agreed agenda on um, the whole question of returning, the whole question of land, the whole question of citizenship, the whole question of religion is debated. We did it for four years in this country before, in, in the midst of real great turmoil and breakdown, until finally, not a perfect, but a, a remarkable constitution, which uh, afforded an opportunity for South Africa to start over again as a, as a, as a place of, of peace and we're battling with that now, and we will go on battling. But there has to be a breaking in the cycle. But the difference in South Africa is that the, the power imbalance was, um, was broken. So when the, two, when the two sides did come together, it was not, it was not a situation of um, one holding all the power and the other essentially being powerless. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm talking about when I say leveling the playing field. Mm -hmm. And in order to get to that point, Israel has to be isolated and it has to, um, you know, it, it has to be stripped of this uh, power to, to commit war crimes. But until that happens, um, there, you know, all these negotiations have gotten us over the past 20 some years is that Israel has, has, it has bought Israel more time to swallow up more and more Palestinian resources. So that what it, ha, Palestinians at the moment exist on 8.3% of our historic homelands. And that 8.3% is in the form of isolated Bantu stands within the West Bank that are completely surrounded um, by, by Jewish only settlements, Jewish only roads. Um, we have no power over our, um, over our water resources. This racist infrastructure of the state has to be dismantled. That's the solution. We've run out of time, and uh, this is one issue that uh, predates my existence here on Earth, and uh, one hopes that we will all live to see the day when Israel democratizes, uh, when there is freedom of movement and rights afforded to all people in the Middle East. Susan Abulawa, thank you very much for joining us today, and Dr. Alex Boreen, a pleasure to have you on South to North. 
Remember, you can tweet your questions, comments, and opinions to at AJ South to North or find us on Facebook. See you next week. Bye-bye.